thank you very much, Bohdan. And I told him that I like short introductions and I wanted to myself mention that um, I'm not a stranger to the University of Alberta. I spent a very interesting year here, quite a way back, 77-78 uh, actually, soon after Kius, the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies was founded. Um, I, then an eager graduate student, uh, wanted to take a break from my studies and found a refuge here at the University of Alberta. I was given the title of general assistant, which meant I was a, a gopher doing just about everything you can imagine um, and setting up the reading room, bringing people in and out of the airport, all sorts of sometimes interesting, sometimes uh, rather boring work, but all bookkeeping, the bookkeeping was the real, uh, the real boring stuff but very much enjoying my stay here at the University of Alberta, which has very greatly changed since I was here now almost 40 years ago. Um, now, the topic I'm addressing is a topic which began to interest me already 10, 15 years ago. I'm not sure exactly why, because no one was particularly interested in the theme or issue of federalism in Ukraine uh, back then in the 1990s or, or later. Uh, but for some reason I developed uh, a bit of an interest in the topic, even came up with um, titles for an article which I never wrote. It was going to be uh, the non-debate on federalism in Ukraine, uh, or another title I thought of, it was a nice example of onomatopoeia, was feigning federalism, and, and so on and so forth. I was in a sense distressed, disturbed by the lack of any discussion or debate of decentralization and, um, and federalism in Ukraine. Um, not that I thought federalism was necessarily a particularly good idea, but I thought that, you know, at least the idea should be, should be discussed. And then all of a sudden, partly as a result of very turbulent developments in Ukraine, the issue or theme of federalism uh, became much more relevant, and that I assume is uh, one of the reasons why I was invited to, uh, to speak here. Uh, so I'll launch into my presentation. I have my notes here, and uh, uh, apart from sticking to my presentation, though, I will very gladly answer or try to answer any questions you have, uh, because the topic or topics I'm addressing uh, go in all kinds of different directions. I can only address uh, a small portion of what I would like to uh, address in my presentation, and maybe some additional issues I can deal with um, um, in the form of questions and answers. So, weaponizing federalism is a deliberately provocative title. It combines a rather ominous term, weaponizing, meaning the act of turning something into a weapon, with a quite innocuous term, federalism, uh, which simply refers to the federal principle or a system of government. Uh, Canadians would probably regard talk of weaponizing federalism as particularly odd uh, given Canada's strong federal traditions and Canada's reputation as a federalism uh, success story. Whether it is a success story again is another question, but it would normally be regarded as a success story. Now for presentations of this kind it's usually seen as de rigueur um, to open with an anecdote of some kind. Um, hard to come up with anecdotes about federalism, I'll be quite frank. There is one, I have come across exactly one joke or anecdote about federalism, and it reflects quite appropriately the Canadian preoccupation to a certain extent with federalism. It's a very, it's a pretty corny joke, and some of you have heard it. Those who took introductory courses on Canadian politics, this used to be a standard joke or anecdote uh, told in conjunction with such courses. I apologize I apologize in advance for what is a pretty terrible joke, but nonetheless, um, as I said, uh, the joke goes like this. It's a rather lame joke. Uh, three students, one British, one French, and a Canadian are asked to write an essay about elephants. Uh, the title of the British student's essay is Elephants, A Tale of Empire. The title of the French student's essay is Elephants, A Love Story. And finally, the title of the Canadian student's essay is Elephants, a Federal or a Provincial Responsibility. Okay. 
there are no other jokes about federalism probably reflecting what a generally what a boring topic it is uh, is considered considered to be most Canadians would therefore be quite puzzled, genuinely puzzled, to hear that federalism has become what I call an F-word of sorts in many circles in Ukraine. And a rather grotesque example of this is a pejorative term, a negative term, which has sometimes been used in Ukraine to describe a supporter of federalism, uh, a supporter of federalism for Ukraine. The term is federast, a play on the word pederast. So, Federaste are those who advocate federalism for Ukraine. Uh, although I should add quickly that this particular play on words is not unique to Ukraine. Uh, on a number of occasions, the term federast uh, has also been used in Quebec and some other settings by harsh critics of federalism to cast a negative light on those. For example, Pierre Trudeau, who strongly supported federalism. So it, that term was used not only in Ukraine. Now, there are a number of reasons for the widespread negative perception of federalism in Ukraine. One of the most obvious is linked to the dramatic developments which transformed Eastern Europe in the early 1990s. Three countries in this region were officially considered federal states. The Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia. Those three states no longer exist. They all fell apart. And uh, the collapse of one of those states, Yugoslavia, was of course a very bloody and traumatic event. So as a result, in this region in particular, there is a perception that countries structured along federal lines are, are very susceptible to separatist movements and eventual collapse. So again, it's a perception. I'm not saying it's necessarily true, but especially in Eastern Europe, you mentioned federalism and many people associate federalism with separatism, with secession. Now, true, many would argue that the three states I mentioned above were not truly federal states since they were heavily centralized and their territorial subunits did not have the kind of meaningful autonomy possessed by, for example, the provinces of a country such as Canada. Nonetheless, there is a very real paradox, and it's sometimes called that a paradox of federalism, which underlies some of the concerns in Ukraine and elsewhere about federalism. Yes, federalism can be seen and is often seen as accommodating and thus effectively managing regional or ethnic or other forms of diversity. It can provide distinctive territories with autonomy that satisfies certain regional, ethnic or other interests, an argument commonly used in Canada regarding in particular Quebec. However, and this is where the paradox arises, the infrastructure that serves the administrative needs of an autonomous territorial subunit can also serve the future needs of this territory as an independent state. And to give a quick Canadian example, the province of Quebec, for example, in Canada, has its own Ministry of International Relations and a network of representative offices, quote, to promote and defend Quebec's interests internationally, end of quote, including, this was back in 2009, 12 delegations, 10 bureaus, and four trade offices. These delegations, bureaus, and trade offices could quickly be expanded and transformed in new and different circumstances to serve some of the needs of an independent Quebec. Therefore, by providing Quebec with the infrastructure it sort of requires as an autonomous subunit, you're in a sense also providing it with some of the infrastructure it would need to operate as an independent state. Another reason for negative and often simplistic perceptions in Ukraine of the nature and implications of federalism is a general neglect of federalism as a topic of studied study and measured debate in Ukraine. And this reflects both a fairly weak state of the social sciences in Ukraine, although that is improving, and the general underdevelopment of the theme of federalism in political discourse throughout most of Ukraine's recent political history. And I know there are exceptions, and I was going to go into a description of some of the historical debates on federalism in Ukraine, but I'll leave that to the historians uh, and move on. As a generalization, I think one can claim that federalism was not a widely 
developed theme in political discourse in uh, um, in in Ukraine in the from the late 19th to the 21st centuries. With some rare exceptions then, there have been very few serious measured debates on the pros and cons of federalism for Ukraine. The federalism debate, if you can even call it that, uh, has been quite superficial with narrowly partisan interests and arguments prevailing. Typically, advocates of federalism have argued their case in the context of defending the rights of a particular region, such as Donbass or Zakarpatya, supposedly threatened by central authorities who wish to control, dominate, and exploit the region or deprive it of its specific socio-cultural character. Such arguments were very vigorously expressed near the end of the electoral crisis of 2004, uh, which became known as the Orange Revolution. Not a term I particularly like, would not, I think, normally qualify as a, re as a revolution. Nonetheless, that's the, the name of the phenomenon which uh, was so well known in late 2004. In late, to, in la in late November 2004, a number of politicians with roots in southeastern Ukraine, supporters of Viktor Yanukovych and the Party of Regions, who were unhappy about the prospects of the election of Viktor Yushchenko as Ukraine's president, began to argue for the creation of a federal Ukraine, which would include a self-governing territory called the Southeastern Ukrainian Autonomous Republic. Now, they did not use the now notorious term Novorossiya uh, to describe this autonomous territory, but to the great delight of their critics, the acronym of the Ukrainian name of this territory, Pivdenno Schidna Ukrainska Autonomna Respublika, was Pisuar, Pisuar, and therefore all kinds of humorous comments could be made about that particular formation. Now, that particular federalism project, however, never got off the ground. And when President Yushchenko soon discredited himself and Viktor Yanukovych made a political comeback, the party of regions, although its very name stressed the importance of regional interests, made no consistent effort to promote federalism or meaningful decentralization. Pro-Yanukovych elites in southeastern Ukraine, who had earlier called for federalization, simply established firm and often brutal control over local administrative networks. And instead of promoting effective local self-government, they established local forms of semi-authoritarian rule. At the time, in fact, it became quite popular to argue that instead of federalism, Ukraine now had feudalism, with local representatives of the party of regions acting to a certain extent like corrupt feudal lords. However, discussions of Ukraine's federalization have by no means been restricted to Ukraine. And here I want now to stress Russia's role in the debate on federalism in Ukraine and other post-Soviet states. Essentially, I will argue that discussions about federalism in Ukraine have been very greatly influenced and distorted by Russia's aggressive support of federalism for Ukraine. In recent decades, advocacy of federalism has usually been carried out by NGOs, such as the Forum of Federations based on Ottawa, or individual scholars, including some well-known Canadians such as the late Richard Simeon and Ronald Watts, both of them political scientists. One country in particular, however, has paradoxically become a very active and persistent promoter of federalism, Russia, which is, of course, a short version of the country's formal title, which is Russian Federation. Now, I cannot think of any country, apart from Russia, uh, in which senior politicians have so strongly and persistently promoted the federalization of their neighbors. Those of you in the audience who closely follow developments in Ukraine from late 2013 onwards could not help but notice, possibly with some bewilderment, that a constant theme of the statements on Ukraine coming from Russia's President Putin, Prime Minister Medvedev, and Foreign Minister Lavrov, among others, was of very great importance, even urgency, 
of Ukraine changing its constitution and adopting a federal system of government. A few quick examples of such statements, all separated by just a few days. On March 30th, 2014, following the Russian annexation of Crimea, and as the situation in Donbass was rapidly deterior deteriorating, Russians, Russia's Foreign Minister Lavrov, during a meeting with U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, stated that Ukraine cannot function as a unified state and should be a loose federation of regions that choose their own economic model, language, and religion. Sergei Lavrov said he and John Kerry discussed the possibility of a federated Ukrainian state at very, very constructive late night talks in Paris. A few days later, in a statement posted on its official website, the Russian Foreign Ministry noted that, quote, the events in eastern Ukraine prove the need to hold a constitutional reform in the country and to federalize it. As Russia has said repeatedly, it is hard to count on long-term stabilization of the Ukrainian state without a real constitutional reform in Ukraine, in the framework of which the interests of all regions of the country are guaranteed via federalization, its non-aligned status is preserved, and the special role of the Russian language is stipulated." End of quote. And following on the heels of this statement, on April 17, this is again 2014, Russia's President Putin stated in a comment on plans to hold new presidential elections in Ukraine that, quote, if we want and they want the elections to be legitimate, then it's necessary to somehow change the constitution and to talk about federalism and decentralization. This is only common sense, end of quote. And I could continue, I could provide ad nauseum many more quotes of, of this kind. Federalism, federalization were new sort of key words in the debate on Ukraine's future. Now to understand why many of Russia's politicians so strongly emphasize the virtues of federalism, I would argue that one can go back as far as 1995 and the Dayton Accords, which mark the end of the most vicious phase of the Yugoslav Wars of the 1990s. And incidentally, uh, right now, we, this is the 20th anniversary uh, of the Dayton Accords, early December uh, 1995, and we are now 20 years uh, after the signing of those accords. Now these accords were a rough and ready document intended to quickly freeze a military conflict, prevent it from resuming, and facilitate power sharing in Bosnia-Herzegovina, Bosnia for short. Power sharing took the form of a fairly complex federal system, which over time was supposed to evolve and lead to reconciliation and integration throughout the territory of Bosnia. Russia was not involved in the negotiations that led to the Dayton Accords. However, Russia was, let us say, not unhappy with their, with their results. Now, exactly 20 years after the Accords were signed, Bosnia is, in a word, a mess. There is a widespread consensus that Bosnia has not evolved in a positive direction and has a dysfunctional, deeply flawed system of governance that seems to only exacerbate ethnic tensions. Such an unstable state status quo, however, uh, I would argue effectively serves the interests of Russia's leaders, since they can use the situation to play political games that allow Russia to maintain a foothold in the Balkans. Thus, Russia, for example, has strongly supported Miloran Dodik, the president of Bosnia's Serbian entity, it's called Republika Srpska, and Dodik has maintained close ties with the Russian leadership. By backing Dodik, um, Putin is able to create substantial problems for the West and compete with European powers for influence in the Balkans without investing much in the way of resources or diplomatic energy. Dodik, in turn, has reciprocated by, for example, supporting the Crimean referendum on joining Russia, a concrete benefit for Russia of supporting Bosnia's rather dysfunctional, or even very dysfunctional, federal arrangement. 
Now, linking Russia's policies regarding Ukraine to developments in Bosnia may appear rather far-fetched. However, according to some senior Russian analysts who closely follow Russia's foreign policy, a Bosnian analogy greatly appeals to Moscow when it discusses the situation in Ukraine. For example, according to Fyodor Lukyanov, the well-known and very well-connected editor of the Moscow-based journal Russia and Global Affairs. It's available in both Russian and English language versions. And I'm quoting here, according to Lukyanov, the ideal scenario for Russia would be the Bosnian model, and it has been discussed many times. The east of Ukraine should get broad autonomy, be almost entirely self-governed, but formally be part of the Ukrainian political and legal field, end of quote. And in a document called The Crisis in Ukraine, Root Causes and Scenarios for the Future, published by the prominent pro-Kremlin Valdai Discussion Club, uh, one of the desirable scenarios for Ukraine is entitled Federalization or a Dayton for Ukraine. That's all that Ukraine needs, uh, a Dayton. Now, a few, a few years after the Dayton Accords, Russia did become more directly and actively involved in a significant federalization project much closer to Ukraine, involving another troubled uh, country, another small but troubled country. Moldova, a former Soviet Republic sandwiched between Romania and Ukraine, was a scene of vicious fighting in 1992 between Moldovan military and paramilitary forces and separatist rebels assisted by volunteers from Russia and the former Soviet uh, 14th <coughs> Army. After several months, these rebels established control of a territory now known as Transnistria, and it still exists. Since then, Transnistria has been the best known example of a so-called frozen conflict whereby Transnistria operates as a de facto independent state, but is not recognized de jure in law as an independent state by any member of the United Nations. Discussions about what to do uh, about this frozen conflict have now lasted for more than 20 years. And some of these discussions have involved coming up with, a, an, with an arrangement for a federalized Moldova that would include Transnistria. Now, in theory, a federal option of some kind might actually be viable. It would require, however, that the major political actors involved engage over a long period in good faith negotiations involving very great concessions by all sides, um, which are inevitable, I would argue, in any viable uh, federal power-sharing arrangement. Sometimes when describing federalism to, or Canadian federalism to students abroad, I, I depict it as a civil war of sorts, but it's a civil war which is fought by bureaucrats spilling ink instead of blood. Uh, but anyone who knows anything about federal provincial negotiations know, knows how complicated they can be. Um, a federal arrangement in Moldova would also require considerable support from a number of regional and international actors. Now, um, the most substantial discussions regarding the possible federalization of Moldova took place in 2003, when Moldova's president, Voronin, proposed writing a new constitution for Moldova as a federal state with Transnistria having the status, status of a highly autonomous federal unit. Russia's President Putin then sent the deputy head of his presidential administration, it was then Dmitry Kozak, to facilitate negotiations between the Moldovans and Transnistrians. If anyone is interested in reading a detailed description of the truly torturous negotiations which ensued, I strongly recommend a fairly recent book, 2012, by William Hill. Um, it's called Russia, the Near Abroad and the West, Lessons from the Moldova-Transnistria Conflict. Hill, by the way, served as head of the OSCE mission, the mission of the Organization Security and Cooperation in Europe in Moldova at the time, and he provides an excellent insider's look 
at what happened during and following these uh, negotiations about this Kozak memorandum as it became known. Uh, to make a long story short, the result of these negotiations was a memorandum, again the Kozak memorandum as it came to be known, which was achieved following considerable pressure from Moscow. Um, and it was considered more or less acceptable, at least as a basis for further negotiations, although it seems that some of the actors involved in drawing up uh, the memorandum were not informed about who had agreed to what, so a, a rather confused process. What happened though, literally hours, just hours before Russia's President Putin uh, was to travel to uh, Chisinau, the capital of Moldova, to preside over the memorandum signing, Moldovan President Voronin called him to cancel the deal. You can imagine how pleased uh, President Putin was. And I would argue for very good reason, that is, why the, why the deal was canceled. Even Hill, who by the way is criticized by many Moldovan nationalists as being um, too much of a compromise figure, eager to please Moscow, but even Hill, um, who strongly believed that some form of federalization could have provided for a resolution uh, of the Transnistrian crisis, even Hill argues that, and I'm quoting here, the federal arrangement proposed in the Kozak Memorandum ensures an unviable state, that is a state which is not viable. And in this respect, it is unacceptable and even abhorrent. He goes on to say uh, that, quote, Moscow's behavior during the Kozak mediation process did much to bolster the arguments of Moldovans who were critics of federalization because they were suspicious of Russia. And the reasons why, Moscow, why Moldova's leadership was concerned about the implications of the Kozak Memorandum were quite simple and echo Ukraine's reasons for rejecting uh, the recent rhetoric coming from Russia supporting Ukraine's possible federalization. According to the memorandum, representatives of Transnistria would have a veto over almost all the activities of the reunited national government. Uh, clearly not a good formula for a viable state. And just two days before President Putin was to arrive in Chisinau uh, to sign the memorandum, three new articles were unexpectedly added to the memorandum. One of them, Article 18, provided for a security guarantee in the form of a bilateral treaty between Moldova and Russia, providing for a Russian peacekeeping, in quotation marks, peacekeeping presence of up to 2,000 troops during a transitional period until 2020. As for the European Union, the OSCE and Ukraine, uh, they could join as co-guarantors of this treaty only with the consent of both Moldova and Russia. Now Russia's efforts to promote the idea of the federalization of Moldova continue to the present day with no notable success. Um, but the focus of Russia's rhetoric on this topic soon shifted to Ukraine. As I've already noted, during the or following the Orange Revolution, the so-called Orange Revolution, the Party of Regions did not become a vigorous promoter of federalism for Ukraine, and it treated talk of creating a southeastern Ukrainian autonomous republic, the Pisuar I already mentioned, as a local initiative. Uh, even before the third round of the 2004 presidential elections, which brought uh, Viktor Yushchenko to office, Party of Regions leader Viktor Yanukovych stated that his priority in office would be to reform the system of local self-government, and once this was completed, then federalism might possibly be considered as an option for Ukraine. In the years that followed, as the Party of Regions made a comeback, it simply became clear to its leaders, and especially uh, Viktor Yanukovych, that a unitary state with a centralized bureaucracy was much better suited for distributing patronage to reward loyal supporters, uh, which was of course a mainstay of the Yanukovych regime. So federalism was sort of dropped from the agenda of the um, Party of Regions.
Now, other efforts to keep the issue of federalism alive in Ukraine were, I would argue, quite strongly compromised by the rather dubious reputations of its most ardent supporters, who included individuals such as Dmitro or Dima Tabachnik, uh, Vadim Kolesnichenko, and Viktor Medvedchuk. Uh, it's worth noting that they, like almost all other prominent advocates of federalism for Ukraine, uh, supported very close cooperation with Russia and opposed, in some cases strongly opposed, for example, Medvedchuk, a pro-European course for Ukraine. The figure of Viktor Medvedchuk, I would argue, deserves special attention. In my opinion, one of the most odious figures on Ukraine's political stage. He is Putin's close personal friend, has excellent ties in ruling circles in Moscow, and is generally considered to play a central role in representing Russia's interests in Ukraine. Uh, several years ago, I think it was 2010, uh, Medvedchuk was behind the creation of a political organization called Ukrainian Choice, Ukrainsky Vebir, and one of this organization's main aims is to promote Ukraine's federalization. Uh, to this end, it has organized a considerable number of seminars, workshops, and conferences in Ukraine devoted to this topic. And if you go to the website of Ukrainsky Vebir, um, it has an entire section devoted to the issue of federalism, federalization. Uh, it is clearly a major priority of this organization, which I would argue is a rather marginal organization, but reflects the emphasis which Medvedchuk wanted to put on the theme of federalism. However, on the eve of Maidan, the developments which became known as Maidan, uh, federalism, I would argue, was largely a non-issue in Ukraine. Uh, overall, opinion polls showed a steady but fairly low level of support for federalism in Ukraine, with between, depending on the poll, between 10 to 20 percent of the adult population indicating a preference for a federal system of government, although this figure was considerably higher, as high as 40 to 50 percent in the Donbass region. But overall, again, all Ukraine as a whole, it was more in the order of 10 to 20 percent. Given the context I've already described, the generally negative reaction in Ukraine during and after Maidan to talk of federalism, especially if it emanated from Moscow, was both predictable and understandable. Here, as a good Canadian, or I guess I would regard myself as a good Canadian, I should put in a good word for federalism and stress that the problem here, of course, is not with federalism as such. Federalism can take very many different forms, and one can easily make the case for a flexible variant of federalism that would suit Ukraine's very great and very rich regional and socioeconomic diversity. In fact, back in the mid-1990s, in an article I wrote about Crimea, I argued that by recognizing Crimea's special status as an autonomous republic, Ukraine had already taken a certain step towards federalism. I went on to argue that an intelligent, homegrown policy of federalism or decentralization could neutralize the impact of self-serving advice and pressure coming from Moscow. So the problem, again, is not with federalism. Rather, the problem is the particular brand, the particular variant of federalism for Ukraine that is promoted by Russia's present-day political elite. So to summarize, as I already pointed out, in the case of the protracted conflict over the Russian-controlled Moldovan territory of Transnistria, Russia's preferred scenario was a version of federalism that would have given Transnistria the right to veto important national level decisions and help keep the entire country within the Russian sphere of influence. In the case of Ukraine, Russia's aim in 2014 was to first use Crimea, followed by the radical destabilization of Donbass, to force Ukraine to adopt a new model of governance. Russia's preferred scenario was, similarly, a variant of federalism, or possibly even a confederal system, which would have granted Ukraine's regions 
especially those in the East and South, with far-reaching political and economic autonomy. And this autonomy would have provided Russia as a partial sponsor of these regions with effective and long-term leverage over Ukraine's main strategic decisions, including moves towards European integration. In this context, it's, wor it's worth noting that in early February of 2014, even before the end of Maidan, um, Sergei Glazyev, one of the Russian president's top aides, top uh, experts on Ukraine, supposedly, I would argue his expertise is uh, rather limited, but again, one of his top aides on Ukrainian issues, uh, Sergei Glazyev stated that the federalization of Ukraine and this is during Maidan, uh, his statement, and I'm quoting here, is not just an idea, but an obvious necessity. And he stated that Ukraine's regions should receive the opportunity for self-determination in foreign policy, end of quote. But I stress that issue of foreign policy. What Galazyev, I think with Putin's approval, was stating that a region such as Donbass as part of a federal Ukraine would have a certain veto power over Ukraine's uh, foreign policy orientation. Now fortunately, over time, Moscow's proposals concerning this and many other issues have attracted growing skepticism on the part of mainstream scholars and politicians in the West. And one rather quick and easy way of underlining the hypocrisy of Moscow's stance on federalism for Ukraine, Moldova, etc., is to point to Russia's own dismal domestic record as a federal state. A few quick, co quick quotes from recent studies of federalism in Russia should suffice. Quote number one. Uh, Moscow's control, political, economic, and administrative, over the regions is currently so thorough that it openly contradicts the formerly existing federal form of government in Russia, end of quote. Quote number two, Putin's Kremlin has in effect rejected federalism or a more decentralized model for governing regions because it mistrusts regional officials as a group, end of quote. And directly relevant to the theme of today's presentation, one commentator in Russia wrote last year that the current situation uh, has led to, and I'm quoting here, the appearance in Russia of the phenomenon of imperial federalism, whereby federalism is considered not as a model of internal development, but as an instrument of external expansion, end of quote. Now, at this point, um, the description of my talk said I would say something about decentralization. And I know that my time is limited, but I should at least briefly ad um, address that issue, um, decentralization. Decentralization, in contrast to the term federalism, has become, in a sense, a rather positive buzzword of sorts in Ukraine. Decentralization favors creating a flexible system uh, that would provide local government with more say over decisions that affect the local community. And decentralization would involve things such as the following. Uh, for example, carrying out reforms to amend Ukraine's constitution and the corresponding legislation uh, in line with the European Charter of Local Self-Government. Uh, it would involve delegating a number of central government powers to local governments to allow them to determine their own policies in the best interests of their citizens. It would involve changing the focus of local government from simply taking orders from Kyiv to listening to citizens at the local level when making decisions about how financial resources are, are utilized. And it would enable local governments to determine their own economic growth plans, at least to a certain extent, create their, their own municipal police forces, and engage in other local initiatives. These are just examples of what we mean by sort of effective decentralization. And there's quite a widespread consensus in Ukraine on the virtues of some form of administrative decentralization. And it's easy to sympathize with the cause of decentralization. Um, some of you, possibly many of you, uh, certainly Roman Petrician, for example, know of interesting and worthwhile local projects and initiatives in Ukraine going back to the 1990s, 
which not only did not receive meaningful support from Ukraine's centralized and often corrupt state bureaucracy, but were in fact sabotaged by apathetic or self-serving state officials. Many of you, I assume, have also been impressed by the energy, enthusiasm, and great initiative demonstrated by many of Ukraine's citizens during and after Maidan. Ukraine is now considered to have one of the most active and vibrant civil societies in the world. Thus, it would seem only logical to put in place a system which would allow some of this energy and enthusiasm uh, to be harnessed at the local level. Decentralization, I would argue, if properly implemented, um, it's almost too good to be true. And again, I stress almost no one in Ukraine is opposed at least to the general idea of decentralization. It's become almost a mantra of sorts in some circles in Ukraine. Back in the 1990s, for example, I remember looking, it was, there was a parliamentary journal called Vice, rather boring journal, but almost every deputy in Ukraine's parliament almost felt obliged to speak about or write about in this journal the virtues of decentralization and local self-government. Even if they did nothing about it, but they always said they were in favor of it. It was essentially a motherhood issue, and in line with the emphasis of um, and on, in line with the emphasis of international donors on encouraging local grassroots initiatives, it became the darling of international donors. Thousands of NGOs in Ukraine, for example, some of them lasting only for a short period of time, received funding to do various good deeds um, at the local level in line with this emphasis on decentralization. Now, I'm not trying to be cynical here, and I don't want to criticize these local initiatives or the funding they received. Uh, but even when these initiatives were successful, they usually had a limited local impact, and often there was little uh, or no effective follow-up and effort to transfer experience to other regions. And this is largely because none of these initiatives from the early 1990s onwards were supported by an administrative framework um, a state-supported administrative framework that would allow Ukraine citizens to gain more control over the development of their villages, towns, and cities. Thus, even though the term decentralization has become a cliché of sorts, I consider the recent emphasis since Maidan on promoting not just decentralization as a vague ideal, but promoting an effective framework for decentralization, I consider that to be extremely important. Still, it's best not to have too many illusions. Ukraine faces massive challenges in achieving meaningful decentralization. One of the greatest challenges is a massive and entrenched bureaucracy, which is resistant to change and very skilled at countering threats to its comfortable and often prof profitable corrupt routines. Decentralization in the absence of a healthy local civil society, not just in Kyiv or Lviv, and mechanisms to ensure the accountability of local officials to their local communities could easily lead to the type of local feudalism I referred to earlier when discussing the Yanukovych regime. This and other challenges, in particular fighting this very entrenched bureaucratic uh, sort of octopus one finds in Ukraine, this and other challenges would be enormous even if Ukraine was not involved in a military conflict in Donbas and did not face a debilitating economic crisis. In these very difficult circumstances, promoting decentralization seems almost counterintuitive, since centralized authority would seem to be necessary to deal with the challenges, again, of what is almost a war or almost a war and um, economic um, uh, devastation. There are expectations, however, and I hope they're justified, that the positive impacts of decentralization, if it is implemented, will outweigh the inevitable problems that accompany it. Even in the best of circumstances, decentralization would be, I think, quite a messy process. That's inevitable. Now, the, the debate on decentralization has been even further complicated by the very difficult issue of the future of Donbass.
Ideally, the general issue of Ukraine's decentralization would have been decoupled or separated from the complex discussions uh, regarding the possible implementation of the infamous Minsk Accords. However, President Poroshenko and his associates seem to have deliberately tied the issue of decentralization in general to the issue of potentially providing some form of autonomy, although it's worded in the form of providing certain specific self-government measures, to the territories in Donbass currently outside of um, central government control. And here I'm referring to the current process of gaining legislative approval for a decentralization package, something which caused very great controversy, as many of you know, at the end of August, when the first vote on that package uh, was debated and then passed by uh, Verkhovna Rada, Ukraine's parliament. President Poroshenko hopes, it seems, that the positive image of decentralization will help overcome the reluctance of many of Ukraine's parliamentary deputies to be seen to support any aspect of the Minsk Accords. I'd like to end, however, and then uh, open the, our session to questions. I'd like to end, however, on a slightly optimistic note. With respect to decentralization, Ukraine is in a better situation now, much better than ever before, to finally begin an effective decentralization process. And this process, if it succeeds even partially, could lead to very great benefits for ordinary Ukrainian citizens who for so many decades have been the victims of government policies rather than their beneficiaries. In this, in this area, at least, I'll leave other issues aside, in this area, at least, I prefer to see Ukraine's glass as half full rather than half empty. Contra spam spera. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivana. Now for the discussion. Do you have any questions yourself, or do you want me to... Uh, oh, I can do it myself. Okay. Sure. talk about the weaponization of uh, federalism. Uh, I'm reminded of the feminist movement of the 60s and 70s that felt that you could condition little boys to be more nurturing creatures by having them play with dolls, etc. Invariably, they found that they made weapons out of the dolls, they ripped the heads off and threw them at each other, and they could make weapons out of anything. And this immature concept of these boys making weapons of everything, uh, we see Ponomarantsev weaponization of information. There was an article recently, weaponization of the Russian people. Okay, I, I agree. I stole I stole the term, no, my fault. No, I'm joking. You have weaponization of history. You have weaponization of Russian orthodoxy. You have weaponization now of anti-terrorism, where they've evolved a way of trying to bring people on side to that movement. And with respect to Ukraine, the weaponization of economic collapse. They keep promoting this that Ukraine is not a viable state, it will collapse, so why support it? So it seems to me that you have these great similarities between immature little boys and an immature state that makes weapons out of everything. And Are you implying that Putin is a spoiled brat? Uh, uh, no, he's a psychopath, but that's <laughs> another issue. Uh, and so can you have uh, decentralization in the context of very immature states. As a, and a large, powerful neighbor at the same time. That's right, that have not yet evolved to that state. Yeah. And, and, and will Russia 
ever evolved. We thought they made a great leap forward with the Russian Revolution. They've now regressed back to neo tsarism Well, this is turning into a speech. I'm okay, so asked, anyways, so, yeah. can yeah, you have that? I won't comment on the issue of what, will Russia ever change. That's not my tonamoyaf parafia. That's not my uh, uh, an area I feel comfortable commenting on. But in terms of the idea of weaponization, I just thought as you were as you were speaking that it fits in with this image of um, Putin as someone who loves playing with military toys, who is building up a very strong, or trying to build up a strong and powerful uh, military. And what you said fits in with an image of uh, Russia playing the role, I think it's often used this term, of a spoiler state, right? If you can't um, contribute in a positive way to strengthening, let's say, a, uh, a strong, viable, friendly neighbor, you undermine that state. You, um, you play a spoiler role. And some argue that um, Russia played that role to a certain extent in Tsarist times, during periods of weakness. It uh, played the role of a spoiler state. And Russia today, which faces very significant internal domestic weaknesses, in some respects is also um, reviving that kind of spoiler role. Um, and, and the problem is that it's nice to project that uh, Russia is a doomed to fail sometime in the next 20, 10, 20, whatever years, that its economy is very weak, and so on and so forth. In the meantime, let's say even if Russia does face very sizable, um, massive internal problems, it can still do a lot of damage, especially in its immediate neighborhood, right? And so, for example, the military, um, the reforms of the military which have taken place uh, seem to be especially geared towards providing it with a good capability to intervene in what used to be called the near abroad, that is, in neighboring territories. Some argue it's interpreting Syria now as part of the near abroad, but I, I, again, I'm not, I'm not going there. Um, so, in, in a sense, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that, um, yes, I think Russia is playing a certain spoiler role. Whether that means that Ukraine should not be engaging in decentralization, whether it needs to develop a fortress mentality of its own to deal with this aggressive Russia, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't think so. I hope not. And I think that um, taking that authoritarian route to batten down the hatches uh, and so on and so forth would, would be a mistake. I think if done well, if done if effectively, Ukraine can engage in some forms of decentralization without uh, leaving itself open to uh, even stronger threats from outside. But again, I readily admit the challenges are enormous. Um, most people um, facing challenges of that kind would sort of throw up their, their, their hands. But just as the activists in Maidan did not do so, um, I'm hoping that uh, Ukrainians will show the determination to show that they can implement some of these measures which would take some of that, and I'm sorry to use this vague phrase, but I think it's an apt phrase, some of the tremendous energy and enthusiasm generated by Maidan and, and circumstances around Maidan and funnel or channel some of that energy to the local level. And it's interesting that in some very unexpected places, Mikolayev, for example, quite recently, uh, a young, very energetic mayor was elected. Uh, a few other individuals of that sort were elected in sometimes quite unexpected places to office. People who, uh, it seems again, were inspired by some of the activities on Maidan and who want to try to promote effective change Again, not just in Kiev or Lviv, but even in these smaller centers. Um, let's hope they succeed, or I hope they succeed. I'm leaving my academic hat aside, putting it aside, and expressing my preference here, but I'm fairly sure it's shared by most in the audience. Yes? <coughs> give up any of that power and control because obviously uh, you know it's to their benefit. However, 
what's happening in Ukraine that I've seen with my own eyes, especially after these local elections, is that, I don't know if it's the right term, grassroots, but uh, the government has already agreed to leave substantial funds in the local jurisdictions for, uh, to expand at their own discretion. And some of these communities, call them villages and settlements, have decided to band together into Hromade. Or, or it's actually not, they didn't decide themselves. This is part yeah. of the decentralization plan. They're being yeah. encouraged. Small centers, yeah. which are not on their own, are being encouraged to amalgamate to form larger communities. So that's, right, right. right. Yeah, I, I, I didn't yeah. mean that uh, it was happening without anybody's knowledge. They're doing it because they're allowed to do it. And there seems to be a tide going that way because a lot of these communities are finding that it could be very much in their interest to, to, to do that. And from my personal knowledge, in, in Poltava Oblast alone, there's some 28 of these Romade that have formed already. And the talk is, and I don't, I'm not sure if it was foreseen or not by the central authorities, that they're already going to be, uh, these Romade, they're going to be a challenge to the existing Rayon ad administrations. Mm -hmm. Like they don't see a need for those when these communities become you know, self-governing. So, so do you do you see it as being realistic that sort of in a, we'll call it a democratic process, that this decentralization just happens? Okay, well, you're being optimistic and there's nothing wrong with that. I would just... There are other areas of Ukraine where this is not happening, of course, so it's a very regional phenomenon. In some parts of Ukraine, yes, you do see this amalgamation of small uh, villages into Hromade, uh, which um, are more viable and can act as um, subjects of decentralization. Um, those interested in this process, I strongly recommend the work of uh, a fellow who's called Anatoly Tkachuk. Uh, he's very active on Facebook and he's one of the major activists. He's actually for many, many years, probably going back to the 1990s, been involved in efforts to promote more effective local self-government. And he recently made a comment, it was quite interesting, that when a similar process was taking place I forget, I think he mentioned somewhere in the Scandinavian states. He said within two years, something like uh, seven or eight percent of these small communities had amalgamated. He said in Ukraine, within a much shorter period of time, he gave a figure of 13 or 14 percent of these small <coughs> villages and so on had amalgamated. So he said that uh, the, the tempo, the rate of this process was quite positive. He said it was almost unprecedented um, for this to occur at such a rapid rate. Although he said it would still be years. I mean, you're talking at a process which clearly will last years and years. Um, whether you're an optimist or a pessimist depends partly on where you're located. Look, and it all depends on, to a large extent, the energy and enthusiasm of people at the local level. There are some villages where I'm sure apathy reigns. No one is going to lift their finger to do anything. Or you have a, um, a local figure who is determined to maintain power and will use all kind of dirty tricks to do that. Um, in such cases, there are always options. It may be that you might need some outside agitators, someone from a neighboring village or town coming and persuading people to you know, um, engage in a more active form of uh, expressing their will. Um, there are always things that can be done. Um, I'm a relative optimist. As I said, the situation now is better than it has ever been. There are there's a greater potential. You now do have official central government efforts to encourage, promote decentralization. Uh, the third vote uh, uh, on this decentralization package has yet to occur, and it will be a very difficult and turbulent vote because, again, the decentralization issue has been linked to the uh, Minsk Accords, unfortunately, and to the issue of potential forms of self-government for some communities in Donbass, as it is ambiguously uh, called. Um, but whether, and even if that third package is not passed though quickly, I would hope that enough momentum has developed and enough Maidan activists, many of them came from these small centers 
to Kiev and have gone back to their small centers, you know, to a certain extent inspired by uh, Maidan, you might have enough of that kind of enthusiasm that, um, what's the term, you might have the critical mass that will lead to a positive result. But this is all you know, in the realm of wishful thinking. Um, it's better than it was. The potential is greater than it was. The possibilities are greater. The international community, I didn't stress this, but is very supportive of decentralization measures to the extent that some are the critics of decentralization are saying this is a Western plot, right? Again, they're channeling money to Ukraine to undermine, you know, the old system and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, just, I periodically hear of quite considerable sums of money being allocated by various European states or the European Union uh, to support um, local self-government measures, decentralization, and so on and so forth. And I hope that money is being wisely used. I hope that there are enthusiasts around who will make sure that the money is not wasted like it very often was. And I'm not saying it was always wasted, but again, there are some real horror stories, for example, of NGOs created intentionally to apply for, to apply for money uh, from Western donors, getting the money, and then disappearing and sometimes reappearing as a new NGO, which would again reapply for funding and so on and so forth. And again, I don't want to mention that this was very widespread, but it happened sufficiently frequently that some donors caught on and became, frankly, very disillusioned about the process. But I wonder if you keep going on this and comment on the politics of it. My impression is with 40% of the budget being transferred to local areas, the national parties have uh, divided up the territory and have fought very strongly in these so-called local elections. And we've seen some really abnormal situations where people have been bought up by holidays and so on well in advance of the election to the point where uh, I mean, the, the Poroshenko people are very insistent on their control of lo so-called local budgets and so on. So, uh, how oh, habits die hard. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it, is it conceivable that uh, the central parties will, in some manner, allow the local people to control their own? Well, it destiny? depends if the central parties change and to the extent uh, and to what change. And as you know, in, um, in the uh, Poroshenko bloc, for example, there is a, a subunit of uh, young reformists who have created their own separate little sort of enclave in parliament to, uh, for example, fight corruption uh, more effectively than the bloc as a whole, because within the bloc there are some individuals who clearly want to maintain certain aspects of the status quo. Um, but the situation is clearly more dynamic than it was. So if you look at the, at the trends, the tendencies, something is going on, you know, exactly where it goes, how quickly change comes, um, is a very, very good question. One can be very pessimistic. I mean, I could have come up here and delivered a very pessimistic presentation, focusing on all the very negative things that are going on. Um, but even so, I would argue that, but there's movement, uh, where there was little or no movement uh, two, three years ago, right? Just prior to Maidan, where stagnation, as it was truly stagnation, uh, you had very widespread apathy. No one at the central or local level, or very few people at the central and local level were doing anything at all. So the situation has changed dramatically for the better. With, whether it has changed enough to lead to, you know, I, 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 I use this phrase, critical mass. You have the critical mass, the energy, sufficient energy to generate a self-replicating <coughs> sort of um, decentralization mechanism and you'll get a tsunami, a, a tidal wave all across Ukraine. Well, look, it's going to be long, painful, difficult, um, but it's better than it was. And there's, I think there is more optimism than there was. And I think there are, po we, uh, there are possibilities now which were not there uh, before.
And uh, you have uh, this kachuk, for example. I mean, the guy's tireless. I don't know when he sleeps. Uh, it seems every, uh, every day he's in a different town or village um, trying to encourage this amalgamation, which was discussed earlier, uh, trying to persuade people at the local level to get involved politically. Um, to, uh, and he's someone who, has, again, has, I'm sure he has many reasons to be pessimistic. He knows all of the problems. He knows all of the uh, um, negatives, but he hasn't lost faith. He's still uh, continuing, and I think he sees re some reasons to be optimistic. Sorry, I'm repeating myself. So, uh, but a question or comment? Yeah. Um, I wonder how the making should be made regarding this question, and who and how should the decision be made regarding federalization or decentralization. So far, what I'm listening from you, it seems like a very bottom-down process where also international mm -hmm. community... Bottom-up or top-down? Top-down, yes. Top, top down, yeah. uh, very international community, supportive, the president is supportive, and, and the, someone is going down to talk to people and propose. Yeah. But isn't well, that uh, yeah. the whole kind of... Uh, no, I think it is both top-down and bottom-up. Uh, I mentioned a number of young, energetic people at the local level. I gave the example of the new mayor of um, uh, what, and so on and so forth. So, well, yes, uh, if you're the mayor of uh, Mikolaev, Mikolaev uh, was what I mentioned. Mikolaev is a significant uh, city. It's not a town. Uh, to be mayor of Mikolaev gives you um, a certain mandate to introduce a meaningful, significant change uh, at the local level. I, 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 even, and even at the central level, I would argue there, there could be more and better proponents of decentralization. What you need are figurehead figures who are insistently promoting decentralization, doing it in a persuasive way. Uh, some thought that Groisman um, could play that role. Uh, he was, after all, the mayor of Vinnitsa, was it? Um, and uh, he, in fact, was given responsibility for uh, decentralization uh, initiatives. He hasn't been quite as active as I hoped and expected, although he is a consistent advocate and promoter of, uh, of decentralization. What you need is a process that, you know, from both ends, top down and, and bottom up. Um, and again, you're asking a question which I can't answer. Is enough happening to m lead to meaningful results? I think there already have been some results. I think the momentum, there is some positive momentum. C circumstances are better than they used to be, and let's be optimistic. Um, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. I have no answers to this question of what will happen. Uh, I wonder, I wonder what are the actors? Well, the actors, they include, they include deputies, they include uh, central bureaucrats. NGO activists such as uh, Tkachuk, whom I already mentioned. Uh, it includes, you know, decentralization is one of those things where almost everyone can be involved uh, because it focuses on small local communities, right? So in theory, um, you know, you might have a village where um, uh, a young enterprising farmer takes the initiative to uh, cooperate with surrounding villages and uh, create a hromada which will operate in an effective fashion more effectively than the earlier uh, villages. Um, so a large number of actors could be involved and that's where I think a lot of the central emphasis should be on encouraging people at the grassroots to do more. And I don't see enough of that kind of uh, effort to mobilize people. Um, and I, unfortunately, cynicism is uh, coming into play with many people becoming increasingly cynical about Poroshenko and his circle uh, and what they are doing or failing to do. And that kind of cynicism or pessimism is, is very destructive in terms of generating local enthusiasm. Um, but um, many people are no longer content to slide back to the old way of doing things. Um, so I would prefer to be an optimist. Okay, but sorry, I think Zanon, did you have a question? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, we meant the courts a number of times. That's sort of the elephant in the room because that sort of uh, 
uh, overshadows everything. And uh, sometimes there was the impression that there is enormous pressure from the West to, com to compromise in such a way as uh, to have almost a destructive decentralization, destructive for Ukrainian future statehood. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you see that kind of pressure? And is, can any, uh, can, and can a Ukrainian government resist it? Well, that's actually a very common theme of, uh, again, criticism of uh, the Poroshenko government. Uh, they've come under this very great pressure from the West. They're knuckling under that they're, um, what's her name, Newland was in Kiev during that, uh, uh, during that decentralization vote at the end of August, and so on and so forth. Whether she was di dictating the terms or simply there to sort of keep an eye on things, is uh, that's another question. But um, no, the pressure is clearly there. I think the not only the extent of the pressure, but the optics of that pressure have been destructive because they um, make it look as if Poroshenko, his strings are being pulled by, um, uh, by Western powers, which feeds into the Russian sort of propaganda message about what's going on in Ukraine. Um, I don't know enough about the dynamics of this process to say anything very definitive. It seems to me that maybe Poroshenko is playing for time. Uh, he is making some concessions uh, to keep the to, to make it look as if Ukraine is continuing with the Minsk process, but uh, I doubt very much whether he is enthusiastic about the Minsk Accords and what their implementation would mean for Ukraine, unless. Um, Russia fully cooperates, which I think no one is is really really expecting. But again, if Russia does not cooperate, it allows Ukraine to continue drawing out this process of, you know, engaging in decentralization in the rest of Ukraine while maintaining some kind of border with Donbas, uh, which may be the best you can have at this point. That is, uh, keep them sort of keep Donbass somehow separated from the rest of Ukraine, try to encourage decentralization in the rest of these territories. Um, and, uh, but I, I can't say much more than that. Sorry. Unless others have wished to comment, yeah. Uh, just a, a question. These uh, Russian, uh, Russian state uh, figures who advocate this particular kind of federalism for Ukraine, mm -hmm. do they advocate the same kind of federalism for Russia? Of course not. And uh, I think I, I mentioned that, that federalism in Russia is a, uh, is a farce of sorts. Um, I could have mentioned, but it would have sounded maybe overly dramatic. Uh, there were certain figures in Russia, some of them doing this on a satirical basis, uh, calling for a Siberian separatism or federalism, a more meaningful type of federalism in Siberia and Kuban. Some were actually harassed and arrested for their activities advocating you know, s certain types of decentralization within Russia, which further underlines the point I'm making. I mean, I think all serious uh, analysts of, of Russia agree that f Russia is federal only in terms of administrative structure and not in terms of federal practice that is meaningful autonomy g being given to it, with one exception, Chechnya. Chechnya and maybe some other territories in the North Caucasus where uh, in a sense they've been given very extensive autonomy but where you have literally warlords acting on Putin's behalf. So you do have autonomy, but autonomy uh, of a rather grotesque kind given to regions where very authoritarian means are used by local leaders to maintain um, control and uh, at the same time show loyalty to, uh, to Putin. Kadyrov in Chechnya is nothing, I would argue, more than a warlord, but he is a pro-Putin warlord, someone who's doing essentially Putin's bidding. And many argue that, well, he was given a mandate, essentially. We will throw money at you at Chechnya uh, as long as you maintain order in Chechnya and ensure that um, Chechnya remains part of the Russian Federation.
kind of a, a, a com more of a comment uh, a question. Uh, there are various kinds of uh, federal uh, states, and they come into being in different ways. Uh, the, the ones that are, in the end, strong uh, have come together uh, from a free uh, union or bargaining of the, of the, of the uh, units concerned, because they face some kind of common threat, and because they feel they will be stronger uh, together rather than uh, separately. Uh, the federations you mentioned, which fell apart, uh, were made from the top. So they were made from the top down. They were not uh, associations of, uh, well, they, they, they weren't uh, freely entered into by the, uh, by the units uh, concerned. So it seems to, like it depends what you're designing it for. <laughs> if you're designing it to fall apart, well, then do make it from the top, like uh, in Bosnia or <laughs> Yugoslavia or elsewhere, and eventually it'll it'll fall apart. Maybe this is a fate uh, facing the present-day Russian Federation too, because it was never created by the free uh, combination of the uh, component parts. Yep, I would largely agree, and I I, I could have engaged in a much longer present going into federalism as a whole variance of federalism. It's actually quite an interesting topic. And Canada, by the way, is not only a considered a successful federal state, but some of the best scholars of comparative federalism uh, come from Canada. So there's a strong tradition in Canada of uh, comparing federal states. So. Yes, I'll, anyone else? So far we should spread out the before we return to you. I'm interested in what's going on in Harkiv because apparently I don't know Kharkiv well. I was there once in 1990, uh, or 91 actually. Uh, I, I Special expertise concerning, concerning Kharkiv. I would stress it's a very important city. Incidentally, if you go back more than 10, year, 10 or 15 years, it actually had more higher educational institutions in Kiev. A lot of them were very specialized, small, um, technical type universities, but uh, a very important center. And I think uh, what happens in Kharkiv is very important. I think the re-election of Kernes, I see that as, as, as unfortunate. Um, but I don't have any special insights into what is happening in Kharkiv. Although the oblast, by the way, Kharkiv is not typical of the oblast. Uh, the oblast, by the way, is overwhelmingly uh, Ukrainophone, that is Ukrainian speaking. Kharkiv is to a certain extent a Russian speaking center in a, uh, in a Ukrainian sea, uh, a Russian island or a Russian speaking island because the population is mostly of Ukrainian background in a Ukrainian, uh, in, in Ukrainian sea. And in some of those towns and villages of Kharkiv, people talk about very interesting and, uh, and positive developments taking place, uh, like Izum and some other places of that kind. Um, also, I know it's not directly relevant, but I just wanted to, to mention the most interesting and productive um, human rights group in Ukraine is based in Kharkiv, the Kharkivska Pravozakhisna Grupa. Um, their website is wonderful. They provide excellent information on a very wide range of topics. I'm just mentioning that because it illustrates there are some very interesting and positive things happening in Kharkiv in addition to you know, the re-election of uh, Kernes and I'm sure many other negative things that could be mentioned. But I don't have any special insights uh, uh, concerning Kharkiv that I could elaborate on at this point. interesting that uh, the, the priest at the, in the local Russian Orthodox Church there came out in support of uh, former region's candidates and the people ran him out of town. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> was, was Can you have effective and productive decentralization unless you bring corruption under control? And so 
Let's look at the example of Indian reservations in Canada. You've got Indian tribal chiefs that are making more money than provincial premiers of very small bands. Uh, the people are poor. They clamor for control from the top, bring this under control. And of course, the tribal chiefs and their families, because nepotism is involved, say, no, no, we're deserving of autonomy and decentralization, so to speak. So can you really bring effective decentralization without controlling corruption first? Well, by controlling corruption, I assume you mean lowering the level, because you're always going to have corruption. You have corruption even in the most okay. sort of... Uh, and not only on reservations, uh, it happens all over the place. Just as a quick anecdote, uh, I remember talking to someone um, from Quebec uh, who said that, uh, she was talking about the 1950s, she said, in Quebec, even the telephone poles are crooked. <laughs> right? That was a phrase she used. In other words, you know, it was an interesting way of illustrating you know, uh, the state of the construction industry and so on in Quebec at the time. Um, so it's not a question of getting rid of corruption. You never get rid of it. The question, it's one of reducing levels to some sort of civilized <laughs> levels of corruption. Uh, even Finland or Denmark, you will find corruption. It's simply at a very small, low level. I think, you know, if, if I'm sure there are anti-corruption activists in Ukraine who are thinking about what can and should be done, it might be possible to develop a momentum where it becomes, you know, popular to root out corruption and to, um, you know, even you might even come up with a financial scheme. I'm sure the right-winger is thinking, maybe we can pay people to root out corruption, right? Or you get so much money if you expose someone who's been uh, taking money and so on and so forth. Um, I think it is possible. Um, you know, the example I used to mention all the time in, in Ukraine was, um, you know, the United States in the uh, 1920s, the Chicago uh, organized crime and so on. I mean, the police were corrupt, the judges were corrupt. Uh, it, was, it was terrible. And they had to create, I don't know the details, I'm probably, you know, probably there are people here who can correct me, but the FBI was partly created um, to, you had to create a brand new institution to begin to weed out corruption because you couldn't rely on existing, um, the existing police forces, existing judicial system, right? Um, but they managed to deal with corruption. Uh, Italy has had some success. Uh, other very corrupt settings, Singapore, although Singapore overdid it. Apparently you can be fined for spitting in the street and there are all sorts of other very restrictive things uh, in Singapore it's, uh, and so on and so forth. But it, it's possible to deal with even massive corruption if you do it the right way. Unfortunately, some of the senior figures, even in the Poroshenko government themselves, have records which are not clean. And Poroshenko himself is not a particularly clean individual. Uh, it would make a tremendous impact if Poroshenko agreed to, you know, dispose, uh, to get rid of some of his business interests, at least some of them, uh, and to provide greater transparency about his own economic uh, dealings. Uh, in my uh, dreams, you know, that's one of them, that he and maybe a few others will do the good thing. Um, or maybe they need to be replaced or, and will be replaced by individuals who, show, who will show greater determination. Um, one of the problems, and it is a massive problem, and it is a genuine problem, is um, the wages of many government officials are such that they almost have to engage in corruption to get by, right? They cannot really live a decent life on their wages, right? Um, and those individuals who do try to uh, avoid corruption will come under pressure. I, I heard stories in Crimea, for example. There was a, a Crimean Tatar who was in a position to, um, he was the one who had to authorize um, construction permits. He had, you had to make sure that there were no treasures or no archeological sort of um, 
valuable places on, you know, on a particular plot of land. And this fellow would be very honest. He would never give authorization unless he was truly sure that the authorization was deserved. Um, he would go home in the evening as well. His wife would get on his back. You think you're such a wonderful person? Everyone else is taking bribes and you're not. What's wrong with you? Right? Uh, and he lived a very poor life. He, he bicycled to work. I'm sure his children had difficulties, you know, getting into um, the appropriate higher educational institutions and so on and so forth because he was principled, right? Um, and what has to occur is some sort of self-generating mechanism whereby it be rather than becoming exceptions to the rule, they become the rule, those people who refuse to take bribes and either temporarily suffer or maybe you, someone finally makes decisions that we should pay more to these individuals so that they don't have to engage in corrupt mechanisms. And I can't help adding because it's, uh, I, I have to explain this to my students who don't understand this. I say, look, it's also a family thing. People treasure these wonderful family structures in Ukraine, these warm, large, warm, enveloping families. That also means that you have to help all your family members. And you may be a very honest individual, but when a, a niece or nephew comes and says, look, you know, I need some help, uh, or I need to, to get a job, can you help, can you be of assistance? Well, that very nice, warm family feeling kicks in, and you very often do things going against your own consciousness, conscience, and, um, and some of that tradition as well has to uh, be somehow degraded. Uh, I think it's all possible. It's just extremely difficult, and it's time-consuming, um, and I hope it will slowly take place in Ukraine. Sorry. Well, maybe on that uh, note, uh, with a little bit of optimism, and speaking of optimism, 